All right. Um, good morning, good day, everybody. I am Maggie. I'm the Community Product Manager for Data Hub. Super excited to have all of your wonderful faces here with us today while we get you up to speed on what's uh, been going on in the Data Hub world. So let me get my screen going. Uh, surprising nobody, we have another jam-packed agenda. So super excited for us to just dig on into it. Um, first and foremost, let's talk community updates. So we're continuing to see our Slack community grow by about 250 folks or so a, a month. Um, we have 770 weekly active users on average over the past month, which is slightly lower than what we saw the, the month before, but still you know, a, a very vibrant and active community. Um, we had over a thousand uh, messages posted, which is kind of mind boggling um, and a big jump up from last month as well. So the, uh, the channels have just been super, super busy. Um, another dip in emoji reactions added. So get out there and give your, <laughs> give your favorite message uh, an emoji. Um, oh, and I completely uh, overstepped this one. We're over 3000 people now. So that's just kind of crazy and pretty amazing. Um, and along with all of that growth, um, I wanted to call out one or kind of new way to look at, at this growth. So uh, we continue to have a very vibrant and active community. Um, and while the membership goes up and the volume of support goes up, the core data hub team has stayed pretty much the same size. So we are doing our best to keep up with things. We're seeing about, uh, about 50 or so PRs open every single week. So those are coming in from, uh, those are not just the core team, right? Those are, are coming in from community contributors as well. And then we also see about 500 or so specifically support messages uh, per week. So um, on any given week, you'll notice that we have a rotation of folks from the core data hub team that are on call and, and there to support that. Um, but it, it's definitely, we're starting to see a volume that's getting, a, a it's pretty high. So this is a way to say, um, you know, we're super excited to have folks come in. We continue to hear that the people are showing up because it's a vibrant and also super supportive community. Um, but I did want to just kind of give a shout out or call out to the community that if you're able to help out, if you're able to kind of jump in and maybe answer questions or kind of provide some guidance, uh, folks on the core team would really, really appreciate that backup because it means we can move PRs more quickly. It means we can crank out uh, new features more quickly and it just makes for a really supportive and lovely community. Um, so just something that I'm personally keeping an eye on just so we can make sure that when folks show up, uh, they are getting the same level of support and love and care that, that we have all grown to expect. Let's talk events. Okay. Elizabeth, I'm gonna kick yeah. this over to you. Awesome, hi everyone. My name is Elizabeth Cohen. Um, if we have yet to meet, I am the community and recruiting ops lead at Acral Data. And some of you may also recognize me from Humans of Data Hub, which I have the pleasure of co-hosting with Maggie. So I am here with you today to share a very exciting announcement. Um, we are hosting our inaugural Metadata Day Hackathon focused on three themes around governance as code. And those uh, three themes are business glossaries, KPIs, and metrics. So looking at uh, governing the intersection of uh, technical data and business logic through code, the second theme is data products and data mesh, governing the creation of data in schema first ecosystems and beyond. And then the third is active metadata, uh, supercharging data governance practices with streaming metadata. So we are so excited and looking forward to seeing your code first solutions address both uh, longstanding and newly emerging data governance pain points. Um, so hackathon uh, teams can be between one to three people and we will choose two submissions for each governance as code theme to move on to the final judging round on Wednesday, May 18th. And with the hackathon, we're really excited to share some of the amazing prizes we have. Uh, the first 50 people to submit a hackathon proposal will receive an exclusive Metadata Day 2022 swag box. And in addition to that, the best hack for the entire hackathon will be awarded uh, $3,000 USD. And then the community favorite hack will receive $2,000 USD. 
Um, some of the hackathon logistics is that the proposals are open now in the Slack channel that's on the screen. Um, and proposals will close on May 16th um, at 11.59 Pacific time. And the final hackathon submissions are due May 17th at 11.59 PM Pacific. So all of this information will be shared out in the announcements uh, channel on Data Hub Slack. So, you know, if you're interested, take a look, make sure to submit um, a proposal and we're really excited to see you all at the hackathon. So thanks everyone. And let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and this will go along. We'll be sharing out some additional um, information next, uh, hopefully early next week around the metadata day, uh, two day conference. Um, so keep your eyes peeled there, but the hackathon is, is ready to go and, and y'all can start hacking away. We're super excited for that one. Also, who doesn't love a swag box? Like, let's be real. Um, I need to refresh this really quickly because we have a late edition slide. All right. So um, separate from hackathon, um, as a reminder, we've had we had our data council uh, talk in uh, March. Shashanka and I uh, presented in March. Um, this is now officially available on the, the recording of it is now officially available on the data council uh, channel. So links here, uh, check it out. It was a really, really fun one. Shoshanka told me this morning that it was a very popular talk apparently. So we're creating quite the buzz <laughs> with it. Um, and then thinking, uh, uh, looking a little bit forward, uh, we're going to be joining the Haya Data Tel Aviv uh, conference in Tel Aviv in June. So I will be uh, flying out to Israel to uh, speak at that conference. If anyone happens to be in the area, I'd love to meet up. Super excited to make it out there. And then uh, later in May, we're going to have uh, John and John, who else is, who's joining you? Is it Tomash? Yep, Tomash. Yep. Awesome. So we'll have John yep. and Tomash speaking at the um, Airflow Summit at the end of the month. So events abound. Super excited to uh, get the Data Hub word out there. Let's move over to my favorite part, community shout outs. Um, we've had just a ton of, of really great submissions coming in. Wanted to call out a few of these in particular. Um, Ashke sent out an RFC for data permissions. This is a really exciting uh, addition to our metadata model, kind of thinking about how do we surface information around who has access to what data. Um, so really, really thankful for Ashke to, for kind of pushing that one forward. We also have Stefan, who's been working on our Del uh, Delta Lake connector. This is one of the most highly requested connectors, and Stefan's just taking the lead and really moving things through there. And then um, Horan Chen uh, pushed out a Presto on Hive connector. Uh, Tomash wanted to give a special shout out there. So really just appreciate all of these like just high quality and above and beyond PRs, folks. And then um, Gary Stafford, I'm not sure if he's on the call, um, but Gary recently published a blog post on kind of like a full evaluation of, of Data Hub. It is a fantastic read. I highly recommend checking this one out. Um, Gary, I think I also saw on your uh, LinkedIn post that you're thinking about putting together kind of like a, a workshop around this stuff. Would love, love, love to team up with you on that. That would be amazing. Oh, thank you. I threw a friend link in there too for Medium if anyone's interested in the, the blog article. That'll get you in without awesome. a membership. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right. And Gary, uh, if you're interested over. in participating in Metadata Day Hackathon, um, let's talk. I'll reach out. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Shashanka, I will hand it over to you. All right. So um, not much new here. We've just been shipping a ton of stuff. Uh, the usual, you know, the night before the town hall, I do my, you know, Git history mining <clears throat> and I go on GitHub and Maggie comes up with some numbers and I come up with some slightly different numbers and then we kind of uh, figure out what the right number is. But here's what it is. Uh, we had 180 plus PRs merged over the last uh, month. Um, around that you know, 200 commits per month mark, um, substantial increase over where we were a year ago, about 100 commits a month. A uh, lot of committers, too many uh, to actually uh, uh, talk about, but the nice thing I'm noticing repeatedly is every single time there's like a cohort of, you know, 30 to 35, like kind of repeat offenders, <laughs> people who like data hub so much, they want to improve it. And so that's great. 
And then every single time, there are new people that are joining the flock. And so this is amazing to see. Um, we continue to grow and also deepen uh, our relationships with people who are making the project move forward. Uh, in terms of uh, improvements, as usual, a lot of um, uh, improvements in the metadata integration section. I'm super happy that we were finally able to get the Feast connector merged in. It was uh, sitting for a while and I had to do some deep surgery on it to get it finally in. So now we support, I mean, the previous one already supported Feast, but it was the pre protobuf Feast version. So now it's up to pretty much the latest. And the Feast community is actually digging in and uh, helping us build better connectors. So it's going to be amazing. Um, so try it out. It's going to be out in the next uh, release uh, in the next day or so. So zero, it's compatible with Feast 0 .0 0 0.18. Uh, we also have uh, a new S3 connector that we talked about last time. Uh, try it out and give us feedback. We are pretty close to deprecating the data lake connector, uh, the one uh, that preceded it. Uh, so we'd love to get some feedback from the community on that particular one so that we can move this into supported status. Um, Maggie talked about Presto on Hive, that's new. Um, Airflow run level info as demoed in town hall is now in. Uh, so try out the new Airflow integration. We did a bunch of uh, work on DBT. Uh, actually, one thing that I'm really excited about is uh, the work we did on query tag mapping. So DBT has a meta section. It also has a query tag section. Uh, and now we support mapping both of those sections um, and also allow variable interpolation. So you, instead of you know, writing out your uh, case statements by hand, you can actually map, uh, you can say everything that's in a particular section in the dbt meta becomes a tag. Uh, highly rec uh, encourage checking out um, the new support there. On the dev experience and the platform, it's hard to combine these things together, but uh, we ended up doing it for, for space. A uh, lot of improvements to the CLI, you'll see simpler error messages so hopefully not as many stack traces coming back at you when simple things go wrong. Um, in the latest release, the sync is actually completely optional. So you can just describe the source and Data Hub is just gonna automatically connect to the uh, default sync. So a lot of simplifications there, hopefully that reduces a, a lot of starter uh, problems that people have. Uh, John did a lot of amazing work on the authorizer interface. Um, this was really cool. Uh, so now you can actually plug in a configurable authorizer for GMS. And the G research team in London actually contributed a very cool PR. Um, it's basically replacing the metadata storage layer with Cassandra. So uh, as you know, by default, uh, Data Hub comes up with like MySQL or RDS or Postgres as kind of the metadata storage layer. A lot of people want to put a lot of metadata in their back in their uh, Data Hub and they want to really scale out the storage layer. So G research um, firm based in London contributed the Cassandra layer. Hopefully in the next town hall, they can actually come on and talk a little bit about it. That's gonna be amazing. And we're, we're gonna publish better docs so that you can start playing around with it if you have a distributed system like Cassandra uh, in your uh, company. Product improvements, uh, view-based RBAC policies have landed, um, research search terms we demoed it last time, and we'll talk about ML entities and uh, a few um, UI improvements that we've done there. All right, next slide. Um, Data Lake fans rejoice. We have Apache Hoodie and Apache Iceberg, both kind of making moves. Uh, Hoodie uh, release 0 0.11.0 is getting voted on. So in a couple of weeks, they'll actually release their push-based integration with Data Hub, which means every time a Hoodie commit happens, an event gets emitted and Data Hub gets to know about it. This, this is the kind of integrations we love. Uh, Apache Iceberg, um, Eric's uh, PR is very close to be merged. Uh, we have done all of the work on releasing the PyPy packages that he needed. Uh, so it's very close to merge ready. Hopefully in the next day or two, we should be able to get the iceberg integration also done. This will be pull based, obviously, using the, the standard connector uh, set. Next slide, uh, schema history, we demoed it in the town hall. It's finally here, um, as in it'll be available in the release that goes out tomorrow. Uh, we made a bunch of small improvements post the last town hall in terms of also giving you as of queries on not just the schema, but also tags and terms. So when you get into that blame view and you look at a particular version of a schema, you're not only seeing what the structure of the schema looked like at that point in time, but you're also doing seeing what the tags were at that point in time, as well as the glossary terms 
that were attached at that point in time, as well as the documentation, including editable schema for people who are in the weeds and understand the difference between schema metadata and editable schema metadata. So that's what we consider like a shippable MVP first milestone for schema history. What will come right after that is the diff view and then the timeline view. So stay tuned for improvements there. Uh, this is gonna ship in 0833. Um, next up is Airflow updates. Uh, we've released run level info. Um, so that's already available. You can see this now. And um, Tomas has some quick updates on support for MWAA, which has been um, uh, a pain point for us, honestly, because of uh, the lack of uh, out of the box integration with Airflow lineage backend. So Tomas, over to you. Yeah, hi everyone. So I'm going to quickly run through what changes happening uh, with Airflow. And uh, just a quick update, how we are currently capturing these run level info. Uh, basically we are using uh, Airflow's lineage backend. There are uh, some problems with the lineage backend. One problem is that currently how it works actually, uh, when it collects the lineage uh, info, it's basically uh, hooked to the post execute method callback in Airflow, which only gets called, uh, gets called uh, if the run was successful. If the task run was uh, failed, you can see uh, actually these run info on Data Hub because the, uh, the, basically the apply lineage uh, method won't get called by Airflow. <clears throat> and another problem, of course, with that, it's currently, it's very hard to set it up and maybe even you can set it up for MD, uh, so for managed Airflow, uh, the current lineage backend. So we were thinking how to solve both problem and one solution actually for uh, the callback issue. Basically, if we could hook on uh, the on success callback or the on failure callback, we could get uh, reliable if a task fails or succeeds, and also we can get reliable uh, this, uh, the end time of the task run. And also, uh, and uh, but, but to add these on success and on failure callback, we needed some kind of solution just to make sure you don't have to manually or add or instrument all your decks. And this way uh, we figured out there is a way that which we, we can provide uh, with, uh, with an Airflow plugin, a custom Airflow plugin, what can, uh, provide and uh, basically in these Airflow plugin, we are just setting uh, cluster policies, which basically what it does in, in short that you can get all the uh, task uh, templates and basically you can hook on uh, uh, or in instrument all the tasks in all the decks uh, with, with your method if you want. And that, that's exactly what we do here with the plugin. Basically we, get, we are getting all the decks or the tasks and basically adding uh, on success and on uh, an on failure to collect the lineage info and the run info as well. And of course, uh, when we finish with this, we will call the original uh, on success and on failure method if set. And why it's great because with a plugin, you can easily set it up for uh, like manage that flow. The only thing what you need to do, is basically one way to set it up. It's basically uh, putting the plugin in a zip file and just uh, putting on S3 and setting up for manage their flow or the other way but uh, which will be available soon as well uh, it's basically uh, installing it through pypy as an uh, as a python plugin and another thing what you need to do in the config is basically enabling uh, or disabling the lazy load plugins just to make sure the plugin is loaded when airflow starts up and just a quick demo how it looks like let me share my screen and basically, if I go here, so I just need to move my zoom controls. But if I come here and like uh, this is a manage their flow, uh, Amazon manage their flow, you can see that like the second first plugin is or, or plugin, and the second plugin is basically the manage their flow uh, plugin, which is, uh, I, I guess, installed by Amazon. And if you just go to the DAX and, and I will be able to click on that, yes. And I go to the example lineage. And actually you should know that there are no lineage backend set up at all actually uh, here. The only if you we install is the data hub plugin and those two configuration settings that I showed uh, before. And if I just trigger a run, then it's basically these two tasks needs to be passed then the last one needs to be third just to make sure that uh, that you can see that this failure actually happening 
if I uh, then if I would go to here and I just refresh my screen. Go one sec. Then hopefully it will load. Oh, okay. Give me one sec. This is the last day. Uh, this one. And if I just the film and I go to the runs. Then you should see here uh, the failed run and also the inputs of these runs. And if you click the view task run details, then it should bring you to to the manage that flow. And there you can see the logs. And and for this, actually, we are using the same. So you 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 should uh, to to get capture uh, data sets like input and output. You still need to set up inlets and outlets because we are still using the lineage. Uh, API, but we are not using the lineage backend to collect these things. Actually, that's it from my side. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Tamash. And I think that completes our project update section. Um, so over to you, Maggie, for the next um, session. All right. Thanks so much, Tamash and Shashanka. So we are now going to move over to our community, uh, our community case study. So today we have Kartik, and I'll pass it over to you, sir. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, let me share my screen and kind of walk through our presentation. I feel like every time I come here, I come away with more work to do. <laughs> uh, so it's a testament to some of the cool things that's happening. Uh, but anyway, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Kartik and I'm one of the tech leads that included health uh, working on the data platform. Uh, more specifically, my team focuses on making the interface between humans and data as simple as possible. Uh, so today I'll be talking about how we've leveraged Data Hub and some of the custom workflows we've created around Data Hub, specifically by embedding different tools that we have directly into Data Hub to make our workflows more seamless. Uh, to, so, so to start, like what is Included Health and why is data so important here? Uh, included Health is a new kind of healthcare company uh, and we're focused on giving our members a service where all of their medical needs are all included under one company. Uh, and so I know that's kind of vague, so like what does that really mean? Um, it could be as simple as you know, finding a new primary care doctor, whether that's in person or virtually, or getting expert medical opinions on their more complex medical conditions. Uh, we also provide a plethora of other services such as uh, claims advocacy, uh, virtual behavioral health visits, uh, and then advocating for health equity for all of our members. Uh, as you can imagine, in this like complex ecosystem of services that we provide, one of the core ingredients for success is clean, usable, managed, and understandable data. And so, uh, you know, given that, like, what is the focus of our data platform? Uh, at the end of the day, it's really about simplifying existing data and making sure that we deliver the right care at the right time for all of our members uh, based on deep understanding of our data. And so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the focuses of my team specifically is the interface between humans and data. And as such, we've kind of taken an extensive advantage of the amazing like open source and closed source uh, tooling that's available to really like make this workflow as simple as possible. And to do that, we've kind of leveraged a lot of different tools and here's a couple examples of some of the tools that we have it included health. Uh, we use Looker for dashboards. Uh, we use Jupyter Hub for more programmatic uh, interactions with data. And then QueryBook by Pinterest to do kind of like ad hoc reporting and SQL based data exploration. And I'll kind of show like some screenshots and examples of what some of these tools look like if you're unfamiliar with them. Um, and, you know, we started this project or this platform about two years ago. We kind of like rebuilt it and we, we had no data to now we have almost 7,000 different data entities that are within our ecosystem. 
Uh, and so pretty quickly it became a, you know, you can't just use the tools because the workflows kind of cross different tools and different domains. And we really needed uh, a tool like Data Hub that acts as the search and discovery platform uh, to kind of like enable the workflows that we really want uh, at scale. Uh, so to give a quick example of what these workflows look like at Included Health, um, you know, a user typically starts with searching for, you know, existing data uh, of various entity types through Data Hub, uh, perhaps reading through the metadata that's been ingested through Data Hub or has been added later on by owners or uh, users of that data. But as you can imagine, as soon as you need to interact with the data or if you need to update any content, you kind of jump from Data Hub to your uh, tool of choice. And so you're, you know, I typically have tons of like tabs open and I'm kind of like hopping back and forth and I lose track of like what I'm doing and uh, it becomes a little frustrating. And so um, again, like how do we simplify this, right? Like that's, that's the mission uh, of our team. How do we make this simpler and easier to use? And so the way I think about this is like, well, we have this like great search and discovery platform through Data Hub, and how do we bring the rest of the tooling that we have into that ecosystem in a way that it seems more seamless? Um, and that's where embedding really comes into play, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and so uh, the hypothesis is that if we can embed the right context in the right location, uh, we can have a majority of our users never leave Data Hub. Obviously, the tools of choice will have better functionality when you're working within the tool. And so when you're authoring or interacting with uh, rich data, it will always be uh, preferred to work within tool, the tool of choice. Um, so the first example I want to show is where we've embedded Looker dashboards and charts directly through Data Hub and uh, the workflow uh, from dashboard to charts becomes seamless. Uh, so here's a, a quick example where you can go to a Looker dashboard in Data Hub and that, that exact dashboard gets embedded. Uh, if you want to understand the metadata, uh, the ownership, the domains that falls in, all of that content is explorable here. And it's really nice because when you go to a dashboard, you want to know all of the metadata and Looker specifically doesn't give you a lot of context to, you know, add a lot more text or add a lot more context than um, some of the primitives they provide. So taking advantage of the UI that Data Hub provides is nice while giving the rich like visualizations that Looker uh, gives. And then uh, one of the example workflows uh, that we see here is that, you know, each Looker dashboard is composed of different charts, uh, charts, explores, or tiles. Um, and so using the lineage, we can go from a Looker dashboard all the way to a chart and see what the, the content of that chart is. And so if you wanted to explore from, you know, like this particular tile and I wanna slice it by something, it's really easy to do that here and not have to jump into another tool uh, and then because this is all through single sign-on, if I was the owner of this dashboard, I can also make quick updates here uh, and never have to leave Data Hub. So that's one tab that I can close. Uh, the second uh, example I wanna show is querying. Um, so as I mentioned, we used uh, Query Book by Pinterest to do like ad hoc execution of uh, SQL data. And so this uh, particular tool can connect to lots of different um, SQL execution engines in the background from SQL Alchemy to BigQuery to whatever you really need. Um, and so in this example, what we're showing is we've added a dex data exploration tab at the very top um, where you, you know, people can come in, write custom SQL, execute it, see the uh, actual data and kind of gleam understanding of it. Um, Another example is notebooks. Uh, I mentioned you can do like ad hoc reports through a uh, query book. And so here's an example where, uh, you know, we have a SQL query that we've written and the output of it produces a chart. And so if you wanted to share the different um, 
you know, reports that people have compiled, uh, instead of, you know, throwing a bunch of different links to the different tools, we now have the ability to send just the Data Hub link to people. Uh, and this enables us to drive more traffic through Data Hub. Uh, more people will add the metadata that's required instead of having to jump back and forth between tools and have the perpetual question of, well, where do I add my metadata? Um, and so increasing traffic through one portal is always uh, one of our goals. Um, and as you can see, there's tons of interactivity that we get from this tool uh, by embedding it rather than having uh, to jump back and forth. Um, and lastly, uh, I also mentioned data sets. Um, I know there's the profiling aspect of Data Hub, but what if you want to do more than that, right? Like you want to query the ta uh, table, you want to join it to existing tables uh, and kind of have a more rich way of interacting with the data than just the profile view. Uh, we've again embedded the query execution tab per data set where it uh, you know, pre uh, populates the query for you. And so you could imagine an example use case of this could be uh, looking at like query history and saying, I want to, you know, this person has run this particular query a lot. Uh, let me go look at it again and kind of like have an easy way of getting to the right data at the right time to make the actual like uh, life cycle easier for people. So they're not wor worrying about the tools, but they're worrying about how do I work with data and how do I deliver insights and value to our company faster. So to summarize, uh, we've, instead of having bespoke tools that are sitting outside of our ecosystem, we've really brought them together under one platform uh, or what, what it looks like to be one platform for a lot of people. And we've abstracted away the the need to think about these different tools and like what the URLs for each of them are. Uh, and really Data Hub becomes the hub for all data. Uh, obviously I've gone a little overboard with embedding. Uh, so maybe we can clean up some of our workflows but I think there's enough value here that uh, uh, hopefully it will spark some of your own uh, ways of embedding different workflows into the tool. Um, and so I also wanted to talk a little bit of gotchas around embedding content because this is a web-based product and, you know, uh, hacking and like, uh, like man in the middle of attacks are always kind of a concern. Um, what are the, some of the things that you have to work around if you do want to embed content and uh, what are some of the things that we had to kind of work around um, to get there? Uh, the first is like authentication. Um, every one of our tools uses single sign-on based authentication. And so one of the things that you'll quickly find is uh, for any tool that needs to set cookies, uh, they will be blocked because of, you know, uh, I think it's like from 2020 or something, uh, there's like a security patch to not allow cookies. And so you have to explicitly set specific headers um, that's described in the link here. And I'll, I'll share this presentation. So if you do end up needing to embed and you wanna look at the content, um, you can feel free to look, take a closer look. Um, the other one, uh, which is like, I'm not a web developer. So uh, this is the bait of my existence, which is like uh, the course issue, uh, which is like cross embedding of different websites into one page. Um, Thankfully, we have, uh, you know, we use Kubernetes to launch everything. And so it's easy to add new uh, proxies through Nginx. Um, that's been how we've solved it. Uh, if there's better other ways to solve this, uh, I would love to hear it. Um, and then finally, um, we do use load balancers a lot uh, in lots of different places around our embedded sites. And so one of the things you'll see uh, specifically if you use Flask, for example, is there's some like issues with proxies and uh, how Flask works. And so you'll specifically have to set some headers to make sure Flask works the way you intend when it's embedded. Uh, again, like not, not like super hard, but uh, you know, it's not something that you wanna spend more than an hour or two on. So hopefully this will help unblock you if this is a feature that you're interested in, in uh, implementing for your own workflows. 
And yeah, uh, that is the end of my talk. Uh, hopefully this was interesting. Um, if you're interested in getting, you know, like a more specific demo or just understanding more about how uh, we use embedding, uh, feel free to reach out to me on Slack. That's the Slack handle in the Data Hub uh, Slack channel. And then in general, if you're interested in included health and kind of what we're doing here or contributing to the open source community, uh, there is the careers page on our uh, company website or feel free to reach out to me directly as well. Um, and that's it for me. Uh, if there's any questions, I can take them or if we're short on time, I'll hand it off to the next presenter. Yeah, I think um, so Ben uh, had a question around um, forking. Did you have to fork Data Hub? Yes, uh, we did need to fork it. Um, we also do a lot of different custom things with Data Hub, and so uh, there's been lots of different, uh, you know, things we've edited. Awesome. I love this so much, Kartik. Thank you so so much. This is insanely amazing. Um, I'm also a huge fan of keeping people in Data Hub for as long as possible as well. So right there with you. Um, lots of love in the chat. So I recommend taking a look there. And we will move things along to john, we're going to cover our upcoming actions framework. Thank you, Maggie, I'm going to share screen. And thank you for the great presentation. That was super interesting to see how you're trying to simplify the workflows by kind of proxying traffic through data hub. I think that's a that's a great idea. All right, so um, just one disclaimer, my apartment complex just mentioned they're gonna be running fire drills <laughs> or fire alarms. So just disclaimer, hopefully that doesn't happen during the demo. Um, all right, I'm gonna talk about Data Hub Actions Framework, which is a project that we've been working on for the past few months at Acryl. And I'm gonna get right into it by starting with a brief history of getting data into Data Hub. Now, if you were in the Data Hub community around January, 2021, you would have probably noticed there were a lot of questions like this in our chat. How do I get data into Data Hub? And at that time, our response was pretty much this. I don't know, um, write some scripts. We have some example Python scripts you can use. We have some example Java, but you're kind of on your own. Uh, come February 2021, we've decided to actually answer, build an answer to that question, which was the metadata ingestion framework. What this allowed us to do is to ingest metadata using a simple data hub ingest command. Uh, since then, we've seen how powerful it is to kind of break things down into simple standardized abstractions. Uh, we've gotten myriad of different contributions to the ingestion framework since we rolled this out even to some sources that the team probably hadn't ever heard of before. Um, fast forward to today, and we're getting a lot of new types of questions. For example, how do I create a JIRA ticket when something happens on Data Hub? How do I ping Slack or ping Teams when something happens? How do I receive notifications when something that I care about uh, has changed on Data Hub? Sorry guys, I don't know if you can hear this, but my, my apartment's coming back over the loudspeaker. I'm gonna to try to continue. Um, so what we did is we kind of leaned into these questions and we found that there was a theme, which was getting data out of Data Hub, particularly in real time. Uh, and we narrowed down to a few different categories that we saw people asking about. The first was around workflow integration. So how can I integrate Data Hub into my organization's unique data workflows? For example, creating a JIRA ticket when a certain glossary term is added to a data set. How do I notify the right person when important things happen on Data Hub? How do I synchronize metadata changes from Data Hub into some other third party system? Finally, how do I actually audit the usage of Data Hub itself? So just restating the problem, clearly uh, we found that there was no easy way to get data out of Data Hub in real time. And we needed a way to build outbound integrations, similar to how we have a way to build inbound integrations via the ingestion framework. And one particularly insightful uh, member of our community on the feature request board suggested that we could build uh, an API for this. 
so that packages could be written for publishing to different systems. And we thought that was a pretty good idea. So we started thinking about what that API would look like. And we came up with a set of characteristics for a solution. We wanted the solution to be extensible to support you know, new use cases, new third party systems or destinations, new types of data or events flowing through, configurable by design so that you can configure outbound connections without coding, similar to the ingestion framework, scalable so that you can scale out processing of events that are happening on Data Hub in the case that you have a large load or a large deployment. And then finally, robust. So a system that's able to provide strong guarantees and handle event processing failures gracefully. Uh, all of this so that starting in May 22, uh, 2022, we can respond to this question of how do I respond to changes happening on Data Hub, not with the shrug, but instead with a framework. And so we've built the actions framework, which allows you to take action when things happen on Data Hub using a simple CLI command, Data Hub Actions. So what is it? Well, uh, in a sentence, it's a framework for developing and deploying real-time outbound integrations with Data Hub. So on the left side of the picture here, we have a lot of activity, ingestion, UI changes. And on the right side, we have a new actions framework, which, which is able to respond to those things in real time and then take certain actions like sending notifications, audit logging, integrating into your company's workflows. And so now I'm going to pop out of the presentation into a quick demo where I'll show you what it looks like to work with the framework. So let me start with, so I'm gonna start by just walking through a hello world of using the actions framework. Uh, it all starts with um, installing the Data Hub Actions CLI. You can do that by just pip installing Acral Data Hub Actions, very similar to how you install Acral Data Hub. I've already done that, so I'm gonna skip this step. The second step is to define what we're calling an action configuration file. So similar to an ingestion recipe, this is a way to tell Data Hub what you want to do. Um, there's a few kind of critical pieces. The first is a name for your action that will be stable across executions. We'll talk about why this is important in a little while. The second thing is an event source. So this is basically telling Data Hub where the events are coming from. In our case, we're just tuning into the Kafka streams that come out of Data Hub. And then finally, uh, an action, which is saying, what code do I invoke or what process uh, do I invoke when I receive an event from the event source? And so you'll see here that we've configured a hello world action and all this does is basically it prints out every event that comes to it from the event source. It also takes some configuration, which allows you to print the events in uppercase or lowercase. Um, just for fun, let's, let's start with uppercase. Um, so once we've defined this, we can now move on to the CLI and actually run the Data Hub action. So we're just going to run Data Hub actions dash C hello world. And what this will do is start an action pipeline, which is basically a persistent process that's going to react to changes happening on Data Hub. And you can see that it has the name Hello World. Now what I'm going to do is go back to Data Hub and I'm gonna start playing around with Data Hub. So I'm on this data set sample Kafka data set. Maybe I'm gonna add a tag called PII. Maybe I'm gonna add a term called customer account. And maybe I'll add an owner called John Doe. And what you'll see on the right side is that something is happening. And actually what I'll do is restart this framework to print in lowercase so that it's a little bit easier to read. Maybe I'll set the marketing domain as one last thing. And so if we expand this, what we'll see is that we're receiving different types of events which detail what has happened on Data Hub. For example, we just added a domain to this data set. And above, we added owners, tags, et cetera. You'll see that there are actually two types of events that we're getting. And I'll talk about these a little bit more in depth once we get back to the presentation. Um, but we have a metadata change log event and we have an entity change event coming in. So right now, this action is just printing pretty much everything that's happening on Data Hub. What we can do inside of this configuration file 
is actually filtered down to only invoke that hello world action on events that we care about. For example, we can filter only when a tag is added to a data set, let's say. And we can do that using the event filter block. So we'll say, I wanna filter for when tags are added and maybe actually care only about the PII tag because that's particularly sensitive for my organization. So I'm gonna save this and then I'm going to restart the actions framework with my new configuration. And now you'll see that if I remove this PII tag, nothing comes up. But if I add this back in, of course, we get the event. Uh, you can also do or conditions. So maybe I care about a tag being added or removed. So maybe anytime a PII tag is changed, it's really important for me. So I'm gonna you know, do an or condition. And what this will allow me to do is now capture events that represent removals and additions. Awesome, okay, so this is super interesting. Um, maybe not so useful though, because all we're doing is uh, printing hello world. So what I'm gonna show you quickly is just what it looks like to build a custom action to do something that you want it to do. Uh, maybe send an email or audit log or whatever else. And this all starts with a simple interface that's called action. Uh, to implement a custom action is really a matter of just extending the space interface and implementing a simple act method. This act method is invoked by the framework whenever an event comes in. In this case, uh, we're gonna just print, but in reality, you would probably do something really important. The second step is to just configure that actions file to point to your custom action. And then finally, we have to make this action kind of available to the Python runtime environment and so I'm doing that via pip, a pip module that I've installed. Once we do that, we can run the custom action and you'll see that it will print out a bunch of events. This is because this action is stateful. It actually tracks where it left off in the audit log. And so it has some catching up to do once it starts up. That's the first thing it'll do. All right, so that pretty much rounds out the demo. I'm gonna go back to the slides. All right, quick recap of the quick start for folks who maybe just want to reference it or who couldn't make the talk today. Uh, install Data Hub Actions, configure an action, and run it. You'll see Action Pipeline with name X is now running if it's successful. Custom Actions is a simple matter of implementing the action interface and then running it. Now, the events that you saw coming in were of two types, and these will both be included in the first release of Actions. The first is entity change event. This is a high level event, which is emitted when important changes are made to a data hub entity. For example, tags are added or removed. Glossary terms are added or removed. Even data set schema fields are added or removed. And finally, domains. There's also many more um, descriptions and, and the list kind of goes on, but these are probably the most critical. And then number two is the metadata change log event. This is a lower level event, which really mirrors the structure of the metadata change proposal that we use during ingestion, which represents changes to the metadata graph. It's a little bit less easy to consume because you have to understand the kind of the details of the internal model. There will be more details in the framework docs that'll describe exactly what these events will look like, what the structure will be and what you can expect in your action code. Now, as usual, I like to take a look under the hood to talk about how this actually works. And really it starts with a few fundamental concepts. Uh, an event, which is a data object, which should be processed by the framework. An event source, which is a source of events. In our case, the event source is coming from Kafka. A transformer, which is a transformer of events or a filter of events. That filter block is actually a transformer. An action, which takes action on events a pipeline which manages the coordination among these different components. Essentially, it manages the life cycle of an event. And then a pipeline manager, which allows you to manage multiple pipelines running in parallel in the same process. So at a glance, this is kind of how things look. You have a source which produces events. You have a set of transformers, including filtering. And then you have an action which takes action on the event. Finally, that's wrapped by a pipeline 
and that's wrapped by a pipeline manager. So in terms of availability, we're targeting release for May 3rd of 2022. Uh, that's early next week. And the deliverables will include the Data Hub Action CLI you saw, sample actions, sample transformers, framework docs, and the two events we described, the entity change event and the metadata change log event. Some notable capabilities I wanted to call out is that we will support distributed actions from the very beginning. This means you'll be able to load balance among actions instances as long as the configuration is the same. We achieve this because we use Kafka consumer groups under the hood, which allows you to load balance among a single stream. We also have robust error handling, a configurable failure mode or continuation policy, which describes what to do if an event fails to process, i.e. do we shut down the pipeline or do we continue to make progress? A failed message log, which will keep track of those events which fail to be processed by the action. A configurable retry policy, so the ability to rerun an action if it fails. And then finally, single process pipeline parallelization. So basically running multiple um, configuration files in the same data hub actions command uh, in parallel. All right, now I'll just quickly talk about the road ahead. So where we want this to go is to become kind of an ecosystem of general purpose actions and transformers that the community can use and share. Processing guidelines around how to contribute, how to document and how to review new components. And then finally, just some framework improvements that we already know we'll probably have to make. Runtime event time validation, a little bit stronger. What this means is making sure that the inputs and the outputs of each transformer and each action are what is expected. Um, failed event replay. So currently we log the events to a failed events file, but we don't have a mechanism to yet load that file and replay it through the entire action pipeline. Asynchronous event commits. Currently we support synchronous acting after an action has actually processed an event, which is conducive to Kafka. And more filter types. So being able to filter by a regex pattern or something more dynamic than a simple exact match. Uh, this is a call to action. We definitely need your help as the community to make this framework a success. Um, so we're going to be accepting contributions on pretty much everything from the core framework to the actions and transformers. And with that, I think that's the presentation. So thank you very much. And I'll hand it back to Maggie. Amazing. John, thanks so much. Uh, just some incredible, incredible progress there. Um, John, please do take a look at the chat because there is a ton of love coming your way. Um, let's go ahead. So just a quick time check. Um, we are running a little bit late here. So um, John, if you want to stop sharing and then uh, Gabe, let's go over to you. And then I think we'll have to postpone. Uh, we'll just post some, some recordings of our other topics afterward. Um, so yeah, Gabe, I'll, I'll ship it over to you. All right, sounds good. That is a, it's gonna be a tough act to follow. So very cool. I'm really excited to see um, all the different use cases that that Actions Framework unlocks. That was a really cool presentation. Thanks, John. Okay, I am gonna talk very briefly since we're near the end of the time about a refresh that we did to the ML entities uh, models in Data Hub. So we added some functionality, did some UI fanciness, uh, and expanded lineage. So I'll just briefly run through this. Uh, all right. So as a refresher, the different models that we have in our ML ecosystem. So we have, first of all, feature tables. So feature tables are going to be reading from data sets and then producing different features about uh, a given thing. And they'll also be keyed by these ML primary keys so that you can uh, index you know, what you're talking about. For example, feature table might be keyed by user ID and have different features about a given user. Then we'll have individual runs of ML models. And so that means each time you train the model on different features or on different data, that will constitute an ML model run. And then finally, we have these ML model groups which are collections of runs of similar models so that you can compare uh, runs across time. So what are some different use cases that you can use these ML features for? So first one is understanding lineage. We'll, we're able to track lineage from data sets into features 
then the models that consume those features into the groups of models uh, that, that those models are a part of. So you can see that end-to-end -end lineage from the data being produced to the models that consume it. Um, also, since we're able to track each different run of your ML model, you can compare results across training runs. You can see which features were used by which runs and also the results of those runs. And then finally, in, as part of the refresh, we made, it, uh, we made feature tables able to be managed just like schemas. So you can update descriptions, tags, and terms for each feature from the UI. So you can manage and document your feature tables. So the things that we added, just to be specific, we refreshed the UI of all these ML entity screens. So they're looking uh, new and shiny. We also enhanced lineage so that we can see that feature level lineage from data sets into the features and to the models that consume them. And then we had the ability now that you can edit tags, terms, ownership, descriptions, domains, and all the fun things that you can edit on other pages, also in the ML entity screens. And then as Shoshanka mentioned earlier in the project updates, we also now have integration for Feast at 0 0.18. That's coming out this week. All right. And then I love this GIF that uh, this is going to, in a very fancy way, just like this alien, we will demonstrate exactly how this works. So I can just get, walk through an example of how we can tie all these different things together. So we have this personalization model group. And here I have run one and run two. And I can see run one pulls, pulls from these two features. And then run two is actually pulling from the engagement and searches, but also signups and deactivations. So let's now I can go click into each one and take a look at how they turned out. So here's, this is the run one. It's got an accuracy of 0.9. So that seems pretty good. Can look into run two. And it looks like the accuracy is actually worse. That's kind of strange. I can go back and say, well, run two it integrated a couple more features. So, so why would accuracy go down? And now I can actually go click in to see the data sources where these different uh, features came from. And I'm looking and I see, wait a second, signups are pulling from the user the deletion table and deactivations is pulling from user creation table. That's that's awfully suspicious. And now I say, well, maybe actually these features are uh, based off the wrong data. So I can then, you know, so first I compared my different models, then I looked at lineage and now the final part of the demo, I can go and make sure that documentation is right. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go tag these things as broken. So I can go add that tag or I can add some documentation. Pulling wrong data needs to be updated. All right, so now by looking, comparing those models, looking at lineage and then uh, doing my documentation and management in the UI, I'm able to make a lot more sense out of my, my ML models and uh, make a more sustainable uh, ML model ecosystem for my organization moving forward. So uh, that's it for the demo and Maggie, back to you. Awesome. All right, folks, we are exactly at time. So um, for the there are a handful of topics we didn't have time to cover today, uh, one is around deletes and one is around um, uh, open API. So instead of trying to rush through those, what we'll do is we will record them offline and post the, the recordings in announcements. That way we're not just trying to uh, crank through it. Uh, but otherwise, thank you all so much for joining. As always, we truly appreciate you. Oh, you guys saw my dogs. You want to see my dogs? I'll show my yes, dogs. Yes, you have to play dog tags. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Tucker's back here. He's hiding behind a plant. Hello. Uh, but thank you for joining. This is Marlo. And uh, thank you. She's kind of a maniac, but you know, and then Tucker is just old and doesn't want to move. Okay. Appreciate all of you. Happy. April. If anybody has questions, we'll stick around um, and we'll hang out for a minute, but we appreciate you all. Great to see you and see you on the internet, folks. So uh, basically, uh, as part of like improved deletion support, so we have added
three things. So, so uh, basically one is like uh, deletion APIs. Basically all rest endpoints have been updated. So uh, to support uh, time series aspect deletion. So we also have support for rollback and retention basically. So this is the new stuff coming uh, that we have managed to ignore so far for time series aspects. So these are uh, special things that uh, basically live only on Elastic right now because of the, their nature. So yeah, that's basically uh, the sort of improvement. So you will see in the docs uh, once the feature rolls out, uh, what exactly are the changes, but at a high level, uh, we allow you to basically uh, specify additional parameters for time series aspects. So when you do delete, uh, rollback, it's like there is no change in the API. It just deletes basically time series aspects as well. And retention, basically, it's like uh, it's in index lifetime management policies that allow you to tell like uh, when to start cleaning up old data. So that's like uh, at a high level what it is. So I'll get to the demo. I'm going to demo like uh, two uh, most like uh, commonly used use cases for each of these. So I'm going to start with deletion. So, uh, ta -da 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 -da. okay, uh, here is my demo data set. So if you see there are no, so for this, I want to use basically the data set profiles time series aspect. Uh, so uh, here there is no data right now. Let's go ahead and uh, magically ingest some data in there. Okay, so this is my secret script that has ingested about, I think 10 aspects, I think. So stats, and okay, now if we go to the historical view, okay, so we have about 10 of these, so stats. So now I basically uh, don't want this. So I want to basically go ahead and uh, one very common use case is deleting the entire platform itself. So what happens today is like when that is done, the time series aspects don't get deleted. So let's uh, basically now see that they get deleted. So with the new code. So this is uh, files. So if we see dataset profiles after ingestion, there are 10 docs, yes, as expected. So now I'm going to run the deletion command that some of you might have already used. So it asks, we go ahead, do that, deleted 13 rows, earlier it used to say three, time series were not like included as part of that. So let's go check our elastic index. Okay, gone. So they are gone. If you go check here, it should be like, okay, nothing. So that's basically uh, that one. So to show quickly how rollback basically works, so this one, data hub. I'm going to ingest operational uh, stats basically. So through this one. So this is my recipe for the demo. So it's gone ahead. So, and if you look at the operational aspects. Okay, refresh, should show four, yeah, good. So now I'm going to basically do a standard list runs. So, ah, it is basically this one, test red shift usage run. So that run I'm going to basically roll back. Okay, go ahead. Okay, done. So now if we go check the elastic index, you shouldn't see any dots left here, gone. So that's about it. So I'll hand off to basically Pedro. All right, thank you very much for that, uh, Surya. So continuing on this idea of uh, deletes, I uh, want to give you a little bit of a story or a little bit of background on um, some of the missing features or behaviors that uh, you might naturally expect uh, and might have encountered in the past, particularly around deleting metadata references. What this means is um, in the past, if you tried to delete some metadata that was being referenced somewhere else, so typically let's say you have a tag that has been used in multiple data sets. And if you delete that tag uh, by default, when you were running or using DataHub CLI to delete that tag, we didn't delete these references. 
So we would have things, uh, we would have what I would call our, our ghost references in the UI. So the tag would still appear in your data sets in the UI. And this is what we call dangling metadata. And the way that we had to fix this issue up until now was to manually identify where all these references were and then issue MCPs to actually unset that property, which was no longer valid. However, this was both confusing for users, like not the expected behavior in some cases, but also occupying space in data hubs um, databases, right? And in our uh, graph um, indices. So this was taking a lot of space, but that's no longer the case. With that in mind, let me show you a little demo. So uh, in this case, uh, hold on, right. Here we are. So suppose that you have some uh, data set, right? This currently is tagged with nothing, has no glossary terms, has no domains. Well, let's just say that I want to add some tag here and I want to exemplify what has been happening up until this stage. In this case, I'm going to say that browser ID uh, is some PII. So I'm going to create a tag based on that, okay? And I have this tag. And what I'm going to do right now is just get uh, its identifier, which is up here. And I'm going to delete it as that would happen right now. So delete dash dash earn, we pass it um, the ID or the earn of the resource that we want to delete. This would have to be a hard delete. And then I'm just going to add a flag old, which I implemented just for demo purposes to exemplify what has been happening in the past. So do I want to delete this? Yes. Uh, it says that it deleted it. Okay, that's all fine. I refresh this page and yet I still have a reference to a PII. However, if I search for it, let me just put, uh, I want to search for everything and search my tags. It's not here, like this does not exist. So this is the inconsistency that we had in the past. Right now, uh, if I, on the other hand, do something like um, just uh, set a domain for this, uh, let's say that I want to create a domain called sales, for instance, and I want to tag that data set with this domain, right? So I'm just going to come here and I'm going to add it. It's being referenced right here. And I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to try to delete this domain to so deleting not only the entity itself, but also the reference that this data set has. And that is done simply by deleting, passing it the earn dash dash hard. Notice that I'm not using the old version. Now this is the new logic. Um, oh, sorry, not run, earn. There we go. And it will say yes. And you will notice that in the case that you're trying to delete some entity which is being referenced somewhere else, we will provide you um, with a summary of where those references exist. For now, we're just showcasing 10 references, but you will have the total number of uh, counts across the entire metadata graph. So this is a matter of, do you want to delete these references? Yes or no? If you say no, it's the old behavior. If you say yes, we will clean up everything for you. So if I now refresh the page, the domain is no longer set. And if I go into domains, sales is gone. So that's it uh, from my demo. There are, however, uh, two things that I still want to mention. So let me go back to my slides. And these are a couple of caveats. The first is that this logic is currently only being applied uh, for deletes by earn. So when you specify dash dash earn, and specifically when you do a hard delete, because that's when you delete from the databases. When you do a soft delete, it's still, it doesn't appear in the UI, but you still have it in the database. That still holds. And the second thing is that uh, computing these dangling pointers, so figuring out where they are in our metadata graph and generating the necessary updates across the entire graph. Right now, this is a synchronous operation. Uh, it might be a heavy operation if the entity that you are deleting is referenced in tens of thousands or millions of places. To give you a little bit of notion of the performance, removing a thousand references takes roughly eight seconds. Removing 15,000 
takes roughly 50. So as you can see, this scales. However, um, we will be very shortly releasing or working on a second uh, iteration of this project where we will address these limitations in the very near future. So you don't even have to worry about it. We'll make the processing completely asynchronous and add and by making it asynchronous, it's no longer on the blocking path. So operations like delete by platform, delete by um, registry, even potentially rollbacks, that's something that we will be able to do and make it consistently. So yeah, that's uh, what I have on my side. Thank you very much. And I believe right now it's Ryan. Yep. Thanks so much, Pedro. Thanks, uh, Surya. Great job, y'all. Go ahead. Super helpful work. All right. We have one more to go. So let's uh, go on over to Mr. Ryan. We'll be talking about open API updates. Today, our REST endpoints are <clears throat> primarily using the RESTly framework, which creates uh, you know, endpoints that are more in line with what LinkedIn's standards are internally and um, have not really seen a super wide adoption throughout the rest of the open source community. So with the goal with OpenAPI is to make it a lot easier to integrate with RESTful um, endpoints through other languages, frameworks, and uh, you know, programming in the way that you want to, rather than um, just our limited set of SDKs and what we can support. Right, so with the RESTly models, it goes from Avro schemas to our uh, you know, Kafka format and our, uh, our SDKs that we support, but with an open API spec, the idea is that you can take our open API spec and our models and those JSON schemas and apply that to um, any language that you want to support and uh, have a, a client that you can utilize um, in, you know, across whatever languages you want. So with this initial set of work where uh, we have implemented the entities post get and delete. So this mimics the ingestion and getting and um, deletion APIs that we currently have um, and that uses a uh, slightly easier model to uh, understand and use then like a raw metadata change proposal. All right, uh, if I can share screen, I'll go into the Swagger UI. So to get to this API uh, and kind of explore these endpoints, we have exposed a Swagger UI. So you can get to that by just going over into the Data Hub UI and clicking this open API link. And that takes you into the Swagger UI. And I'm going to switch over to this tab because I already have some requests filled out. So basically, what you get here is um, all of the schemas that we have internally. These are processed from PDL and translated over into JSON schemas. And um, these are, uh, and we also have generated Java models that we use in our Java SDK and in inside Data Hub itself. So, uh, for example, for the post endpoint, um, you can go in and see the schema of this request. So it has the entity type the urn of the entity and the aspect you want to send in. And uh, alternatively to the urn, you can send in the key aspect, uh, similar to how a metadata change proposal has. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit easier uh, to have that object format to actually send in. So this aspect supports any of the aspects we have inside here. So you can go in and explore these and you get uh, 
fully documented descriptions, example uh, values, uh, and uh, you know, it gives you all of the information you would need to construct a request uh, just in this UI directly. So one thing you'll notice is this uh, underscore underscore type. So for anything that exists in a union uh, type, we have to specify what the class is. This is because not all classes have, uh, you know, completely unique properties. So with JSON, it's just, you know, raw JSON, you, you don't have your, uh, your class types and what have you. So you have to um, you know, know what is actually being sent across so that we can translate it. Uh, but yeah, so there's lots of these to explore. I won't go through everything, but you can see that uh, this in will enable you to create a request to actually ingest or and, and know what you're getting back. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a quick example. So this is a ingestion example for this urn, and I'm sending in a schema metadata aspect. Uh, these are all a part of a postman collection that I'm going to include with documentation uh, whenever this PR gets in. And so we'll just go ahead and run that. And so we get a 201 accepted response. Um, and we get the urn that got updated back. So if we go ahead and take this urn and then put it into the git, and we get back our schema metadata aspect, we get this response with the key and the schema metadata. And this all lines up with what got sent in. And then we can also do a delete of that same urn. And so this supports both soft and hard deletes. Uh, we'll go ahead and do a hard delete and completely remove it. So that gives you the urn back that got deleted. And now if we go ahead and run that same git, we just get the key, which should be hard deleted, should be completely gone. So this PR is open. Uh, it's currently under review and it's going to get put out and not this release, but the, the next one. Uh, so currently, the top level API is under evolution. So we're, we're trying to get feedback on this, right? So this is our initial setup. And we, we would like to get you know, comments back and uh, know how people want to use this and, and really fine tune this and, and get it working. So please play with it. Uh, let us know what you think and uh, get back to us and, and let us know uh, how we can improve it. All right, everybody. Thanks so much, Ryan.